I'm talking about a, a, a declarative framework for machine learning, very much in the spirit of in, inductive logic programming. Um, I'll speak about this for a while, and then I'll go to two specific results from recent papers. Uh, they are joint work with my, my student Martin Ritzert and, and also Christoph Löding. Uh, this one I'll only talk about very briefly, and I hope I'll have some time left to, to uh, go into a bit more detail here, and that's also where automata come in, by the way. So you won't see much of automata uh, in this talk, uh, despite the fact that the session was supposed to be an automata session, apparently. <laughs> Um, but, but, but here it's, uh, you'll see that they are somehow there. Okay, uh, so, so let's see. Uh, basically, okay, I, I'll start with uh, very general and like uh, 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 general uh, observations about machine learning. Um, well, we have a very algorithmic uh, focus. Our goal is usually to to, to construct a function that approximates an unknown function. Okay, and that's, that's our model, but uh, what we want to have is just make good pred predictions basically about the unknown function. Um, another point is that it may be quite difficult to, uh, to decide which algorithms to use, which parameter settings, which network topology, there are all these things. Uh, if you want good results, you probably should know what you're doing. Uh, many people apply these things uh, who don't know what they are doing, including me, you may say. But uh, uh, that's, that makes it difficult, right? Um, now, the models we generate are very often determined by the algorithm. We pick an algorithm and then some model comes out. And we're not thinking about what that model might be. Uh, we, we're thinking about which algorithm we use, or maybe we're not thinking about it, just using uh, whatever everybody else is using, and then we get some model. Um, <clears throat> we put very little em emphasis on it, and we usually don't understand what the models are actually uh, doing, and we can't explain what they do. And this, I think, uh, Nate also mentioned this, this is a very important point to me. I, th this is really... Uh, in a way, what I think is, is uh, the, 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 the real motivation for doing uh, research of the kind I'm, I'm, I'm doing here. And let me add another story uh, to, to what we just heard. I, I was talking a lot to people from our physics department recently. They, they are all using uh, deep learning for all kinds of things. And... Um, well, it's natural then that they talk to us, and so we talked, it's all very interesting, and often they get, they get models by deep learning which do much, much better than their own physical models, okay? And that, that kind of puzzles them, of course. Um, and definitely they, they would like to understand what these models do, so, so, so there, uh, you, you see this thing again, but now you see it in a kind of formal way. So, for example, suppose we would just run some machine learning algorithms on just astronomical data, okay? And prob with the goal of predicting movement of planets, whatever, okay? So I'm sure this is all not so terribly complicated, the functions we see there. We would get a, a function that predicts where Mars is tomorrow at... Uh, what's uh, 1 a.m. Uh, quite exactly. So, so in, this, in this way, it would work. But then the real question is, can we get Newton's laws out of this? They, they should be there somewhere. Uh, or maybe they are not. Maybe there's something else. But uh, we would like to understand what it is. Uh, and th that kind of puzzles me. How do we do this? I have no idea. I mean, I won't give you an answer to that. Uh, but, but, but that's the, the, the kind of question. Uh, that really motivates me uh, to, to, to look into these things. Okay, so, so we take a declarative approach, which means that we kind of try to separate models uh, from the solvers. We want to think of uh, what are good models, what, what uh, do we... Yeah, let, let's just keep it like this. I think in this room people know what, uh, what is meant by this. And, the framework I'm proposing is very 
close to that of inductive logic programming. It's a little bit different and um, we'll see uh, in the talk that this different leads to a somewhat different perspective, I, I believe. Um, so the background logic, we're not representing it by theory uh, as it's typically done in, in, uh, in uh, inductive logic programming by the biological structure. This structure may uh, just capture arithmetical knowledge, so it could be something like the field of real numbers or also some fancy Hilbert space, whatever you want, uh, but also structural knowledge that is just there, like the web graph, like a relational database, things like this. And actually, um, I should also say that my approach to this is very much inspired by uh, by uh, what happens in database systems, in relational databases in particular, where we have a very, uh, very clear declarative uh, approach that works very well. And, uh, and you'll see in many places that I'm, I'm coming from this side and I'm looking at things uh, from, from this angle. So, so in a way, uh, data analysis I, I, I would see as some extension of just querying. In, in, in traditional database systems, when you query, you retrieve facts from the database. Now in, in the settings I'm thinking about here, you would not only want to retrieve facts, but you also want to get predictions uh, about things that are not facts in your database. But still, you're, you're doing some kind of querying. Um, okay. Um, so, the, anyway, the, the, the background knowledge is in a structure, and then the model we generate is described by a formula of a suitable logic. Um, and usually we have some free variables there, <coughs> which would be our parameters. So we have parametric models, and we leave it completely open at the moment what, what logics might be. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important question to find good uh, good logics to describe the law models you're, you're interested in here. Um, what I'm doing is kind of uh, disappointing, but in the end we have to do something. I'm just starting with the logics I know and I know how to deal with, like first order logic and so on, and, and I, I get somewhere there, but that should not be the end. And, and again, that's in, in the, there we deviate a bit from inductive logic programming. We, we leave it completely open what might be good logics here. Um, okay, so, so let me just show you two examples uh, how, how this all works. So um, the, the, the first, a very simple, we want to classification problem, Boolean classification, we want to predict chances on the academic job market uh, based on publication data. Certainly something some people in this room may be interested in, um, but anyway. Um, so we view the, this as a Boolean classification problem. So instances would be uh, the, the applicants or some data about the applicants and the question is whether they get a, a job or not. Okay, so uh, our data is precisely, I mean the training data would be a list of past applicants and whatever data we have about them. Okay, and they are labeled by whether they were successful or not. All right, uh, so, so let's, let's look at two different scenarios here just to, to show you how, uh, how this may turn out. So the first would be that we just have two pieces of information about each candidate, uh, number of pub publications, years since PhD, okay? So now basically our data points are just points in the two-dimensional plane, so the data set might look like like this, and there we have successful candidates, and there we have unsuccessful. And I'm using this color coding throughout the talk, so orange will mean yes instance, and this blue uh, is, is a no instance, okay? And here we may guess that a linear model uh, might do, do, do pretty well, something like this. Um, it, it won't work exactly as you can see here where things overlap, but uh, but good enough, we can't predict to, uh, can't expect to predict really the outcome of all hiring decisions based on publication, uh, number of publications and years since PhD. That's also clear. So we won't get a perfect model, it may be something like this, okay? And now this is very much in the, in the realm of standard machine learning techniques, okay? 
um, but we can phrase it in our model. So here, the background structure would simply be the ordered fields of the real, say, where we can express the necessary arithmetic. Or it could also be the two-dimensional vector space over the reals. And <clears throat> um, our model would, would be precisely this linear thing. And another piece of notation, we have two uh, variables that uh, are for the parameters. That the y variables and the x variables always describe the instances. Again, something I'm using throughout. All right, um, let's look at the same thing uh, in a different scenario with different data. And uh, this is where we get closer to databases. Suppose we just have a database on publications now, something like DBLP, but uh, maybe a, a, a bit different. Uh, I don't really care too much about how it looks, but let's say we have a table uh, with information about the authors and a table with information about the publications, okay? Again, that's the data we have. And then we have training examples of, of instances that would be just authors in our database uh, identified by their IDs. And now we want to make predictions of whether they will, will be successful on the job market or not, okay? And the database now would be our background structure in my framework, and now we can kind of phrase, uh, describe a model uh, uh, like this. I, I've written something completely uh, nonsensical there, but uh, well, you can read it or not. We, 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 we just write a few things that we, we think might work, and again, we may have some parameters like uh, numbers, uh, we may have parameters for certain universities, for certain journals, uh, whatever. That's, that's what I want to convey. And, and then we can write down something like this uh, in a language like SQL, okay? Um, but again, since we, we're, we're not only interested on the past performance, that would be just your standard database query, but we're interested in in the future performance, in a way, uh, which, which is what makes this different from, from just database query, okay? And then now let's look at another example, um, and that's, that's, again, okay, that's the automata connection, also very standard, uh, standard example. We want to learn a formula of monadic second-order logic or a regular expression that selects certain positions in a string. Okay, maybe because we want to reply, uh, replace them. Imagine you want to do something like uh, the, the, the replacement in a string, but, but learned by examples because you don't want to figure out the regular expression. Okay, something like this. So uh, now your data would be a fragment of the string with certain positions marked like this. This is just a fragment of the uh, LaTeX file underlying my talk. <coughs> And actually, the positions that are marked here turn out to be that uh, uh, all positions with a letter B uh, in the context of LaTeX map. Uh, so, so whatever. You can imagine you would want to learn regular expression. What, what you can also do in this framework is um, you, you have your parameters, which would just be positions in a long string. So you can just say, OK, I want to look between here and here. And you can actually try to learn between where and where you look, okay? That would be uh, to learn the parameters. But uh, these examples are just there to give you an idea how, uh, how, how I think of, of uh, what a framework like the one I'm using here might do, okay? And now let's go uh, to the more formal stuff and let's just briefly look over this uh, formally once. So we consider a Boolean classification here um, that's just for simplicity. Um, I think it's, it's reasonably easy to, to extend this to, to, to other types of problems, but let's just stick with Boolean classification uh, here. So, as I said, we have a background structure that may be a finite or infinite structure. I always denote it by B, and the universe is U of B. Okay? Now, the instances of my learning problem may be just elements of this background structure, but often they are tuples of elements. As in our first, first examples, there were, there were pairs of real numbers. Okay? And this K 
which is the length of the tuples, is what we call the dimension of the problem. Now, that's always relative to, to our choice of the background structure. So it's part of, uh, of our whole yeah, background modeling, whatever you want to call it. Okay, uh, And then we have the formula describing our model. As I said, it's a parametric model, so it's a formula of some logic. We have three variables, x, 1 through xk. Now, the k is the same as the k here. That's uh, what describes the instances. So we call these the instance variables. And then we have uh, some number of parameters. OK? The, that's our parameter vari uh, variables. And then uh, we can generate from this hypothesis or models uh, by well, choosing uh, the formula and a, a good choice of parameters in the background structure, okay? And uh, I cast this here as a Boolean function, so uh, whenever I have this formula and I have a tuple v, an assignment for the, the y variables, uh, then uh, I get a Boolean function that maps all instantiations for the x variables to, to 0, 1, depending on whether uh, the formula holds or not, okay? And that's the type of hypothesis I'm looking at and I'm trying to learn, okay? Um, now, uh, now, now, here's uh, an important remark, um, yeah, w which determines how we, we think about the complexities here. Uh, now, the background structure, I said captures both abstract knowledge, like how do you do calculations in the reals, uh, and specific data, okay? Uh, but, but potentially very large data sets. Think of the web graph, something like this. And what this means is um, we usually don't see all the data. We don't see the whole uh, background structure. At, at least we don't want to look at it at runtime. Just uh, if, if you think uh, of a querying situation, an interactive situation, you certainly don't want to search the whole web graph every time uh, some query comes up. Uh, okay, um, and that's important, and I think that that's also a different angle from what people usually looked at in in inductive logic programming. There, the the theory, the background knowledge was just part. <coughs> Uh, part of, uh, of their specification, and, the, the, and here we, we look at this background knowledge in a slightly different way, okay? Um, and, and, and the key point of our results will always be uh, we want to be able to learn without looking at the whole structure. So in a sense, we want to be, uh, work in sublinear time in this background structure, okay? Um, we leave it open at the moment what may be a good logic. Um, the logics I'm looking at, first order monadic, second order, are not what I'm, I'm striving for. They are the starting point because I know this techniques. It's as simple as that. Uh, um, now, now that's, certainly we want logics that have uh, kind of numerical components in them, quantitative components. Um, but, uh, well, uh, I'm only at the beginning here. Uh, okay. Now, if, if, if you think about this, probably you, you, you don't want to use something uh, like this in, a, in computer graphics, whatever, but more in a, in a, in a context that is already uh, close to, to formal models, like database systems, like verification, say. Um, but that's just uh, speculation here, and it's not so important. Okay, so uh, let's briefly talk about uh, how we view the learning here and, in a sense, what the results will mean then. So the input to our algorithms, well, in some sense, will be the background structure, except, expect that we, except that we don't see the whole background structure. Uh, but, but, but it's, of course, it's somehow there, but then the actual input will be the training example, so that will be labeled examples consisting uh, of tuples of instance uh, instances. So, so all the use to describe an instance, the lambdas are just the labels, 0 or 1 in my case. Okay, And t I will always use for the length of this tra training sequence. Okay, um, 
And our goal is to find a hypothesis of this form that generalizes well. So predicts uh, unknown, uh, the, the, the values on unknown instances well, okay? And well, of course, we don't, we don't know about the unknown instances. That's why they are unknown. So um, we, all we see is the training data and the error on the training data, the empirical error, empirical risk. That's just the fraction. So if we have a hypothesis, the training error is the fraction of uh, examples that are classified in the wrong way. Um, and that, that's what we, what we try to see and usually want to minimize. Well, actually, we have to be careful to avoid overfitting and so on. I, I'm sure most people in this room uh, know the routine, but very briefly. So we want to, to minimize uh, training error plus some regularization term. Okay, um, th that's just what we always do in machine learning, but then we... <coughs> It's important to see that the algorithmic problem we have to solve is essentially a minimization uh, problem like this. And the hypotheses for us are always of this form I just described before. Uh, so we have to find a formula. Well, we may also regard the formula, the model as fixed, and certainly we have to find the right parameter values, okay? Um, now, this regularization term here would typically just depend on the formula, uh, somehow measuring the complexity of the formula. Um, like maybe be a function of the quantifier rank, uh, also a function, by the way, of the number of parameters, of course. Um, now, what we will do very often is just regard the formula as fixed, or at least as its quantifier rank. Now, now, that's a great simplification uh, we just make, but if we do this, basically the uh, regularization term becomes irrelevant. It's just a constant then. Um, so we, we just have to minimize uh, the training error, and that's uh, uh, something known as empirical risk minimization, and that's essentially what we do. That's what our algorithms do. Um, now you may ask why... Uh, do we assume then that what, whatever we do generalizes well? Uh, well, there's some theoretical results um, <coughs> behind this. Um, the, the classes we look at here uh, all have bounded VC dimension, the cl classes of hypothesis. At least VC dimension bounded depending on the quantifier rank. So, um, and I decided to leave these results out of the talk, but what they imply is uh, that we always have a pack learnability here, at least in an information theoretic sense. Um, but this doesn't tell us anything about uh, complexity. It doesn't give us efficiency guarantees. And uh, the, the results I'll be talking about will precisely be about efficiency. Okay, so, so, so. Uh, these things, the, the bounded VC dimension, has been known for quite a while. Um, actually, some of the results are just old results uh, uh, from, from mathematical logic and, and model theory. So, for example, if the background structure is the reals that first order definable uh, predicates have bounded VC dimension goes back to work, well, actually, to work of Tarski, I would say, uh, and then certainly Shela from the early 1970s. Uh, for, for the other classes of finite structures, it's more recent results, but anyway. Okay, so, so in principle, we can learn here, and all we need to do is minimize the empirical risk. Okay, but now we still have to find out how we do this. Okay, and let me just uh, talk about the computation model, which is kind of important because we want to work in sublinear time, okay? So, so we, first of all, we use a standard random access model of computation, standard RAM machines. Uh, we, we take a uniform cost measure. Uh, that's a slight simplification, but doesn't make a difference. Otherwise, we have some logarithmic factors in there. Uh, well, uh, if the... Some of the results also apply to infinite background structures, but let me assume in the following, just for simplicity, 
uh, the, the background structure is always finite, okay? Um, and then we have this uniform cost measures. Again, if, if we don't do this, we have additional log factors which are not so important, okay? Um, the thing is, even if finite, we assume the background structure to be very large and we want our learning algorithms to run in sublinear time, okay? And so we can never see the whole, uh, whole background structure. Uh, and so then we need if just sampling certain... Uh, Places in memory won't get us very far. So, so we need a more structured access uh, to the background structure then. And I, I call this local access, and it, it may mean something different in different contexts. But basically, the idea is if you have an element, say a vertex of a graph, and you hold that in memory, you, you want to, to be able to retrieve its neighbors. OK? Uh, so, so, so at least you can retrieve the structure locally. Okay, you certainly need something like this if you want to get any meaningful uh, results, but that makes a lot of sense. If you think of your graph as being the web graph, you can follow links. Okay, that's, uh, that's plausible, right? Um, so, uh, that's our computation model. Now, now what, what do we want to achieve? We basically, Mark, yes? Ask, when you say sublinear, do you mean in the number of samples? Uh, I'm coming to this now. That's this slide, so perfect question. Uh, okay, so what we want is we want our algorithms, I ideally want, to run polynomial in the size of the training data and the number of training uh, examples, regardless of the size of the background structure. Now we may say polylogarithmic in the size of the background structure is still fine, but something like this. Uh, yes? So um, you said in your uh, statement about cache vulnerability that it yeah. Yes, uh, that's why I say in an information theoretic th sense. So I'm not using Valiant's original model, but these days I think uh, pack learnability is often understood as just uh, something about sample complexity. Uh, anyway, that's what I mean here, and uh, that's what, what this in a, an information theoretic sense means. I mean, uh, if you want to go back to Valiant, then basically what I'm saying here, I want to be polynomial in the size of the training data is precisely going back to Valiant's, uh, to Valiant's model. Uh, okay, uh, so in fact, we have this old result about VC dimension, precisely this bothered me. So, uh, so, so then a while ago with my student Martin, uh, we started to look precisely at this. Can we, uh, can we get something reasonable in the size of the... Uh, Training data. The, the original 1990s pack learning uh, results for IoT uh, were all in the original yeah. framework, so they're quite comparable. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, but uh, the, I, I'm not sure because the, the, the background theory then is part of the. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, it's. Uh, uh, it, it, I'll, I'll just show you my results and then we can discuss how and how far they are comparable or not. Um, okay, uh, so we want to be polynomial in the size of the training data. Um, now, there's also uh, this issue about complexity in terms of the, uh, uh, the formula, and there we take a very easy way out, which is, uh, is not so nice, but it's all I can do, and actually it's very common to do this in, in database theory. We, we take a data complexity, point of view, uh, saying basically we regard the formula as fixed, or at least its size as fixed. The idea being that the formula, which is supposed to describe something we can actually read as humans and understand, uh, will probably be very small compared to the size of the data, and uh, therefore uh, we, we can just ignore this. Now, that's a very shaky assumption. Uh, I know this, as it is in databases, by the way. Um, 
But on the other hand, in database theory, it, it worked well, and the results coming out of this are, are reasonable results. They have proved uh, to be reasonable. After all, relational databases work pretty well, and they, they have a very strong theoretical founding. So, so, so let's just stick with this. Uh, again, that's all I can do. Of course, one could, could think of uh, more precise or, or the better analysis involving the right regularization terms and all that. Okay, um, now if we fix the formula basically we can ignore regularization as I said before so basically we just do empirical risk minimization. So the algorithmic problem we have to solve is basically we're given this background structure in a way that we can't fully see it but uh, but, but it's somehow there. We're given the training examples and we want to find a formula of some fixed quantifier rank and a tuple of parameters such that the training error is minimized. Okay? And through these VC dimension results, we can then hope that it generalizes fairly well uh, if we just do empirical risk minimization. Okay? So, so that's, that's the setup. And now let me look at... Uh, some results. Um, okay, uh, the first is just about first order logic um, and the result is as follows. And I'll be very brief about this one. Uh, basically, there's a learning algorithm for first order logic in this setup just described and it runs in time. Uh, T was the number of training examples, D is the maximum degree of the background structure. Okay, so if the degree is constant, this would just be another constant and I'd be polynomial in the, uh, in the size of the training data. Um, if, um, if D is, say, polylogarithmic, the whole thing would be polynomial in the size of the training data and polylogarithmic uh, in, uh, in the size of my background structure, which I think is still good. So, uh, so I think this is quite interesting. We only have to inspect a small part of the, uh, the background structure in these low, say if we're in low degree graphs, and we can still, uh, we, we can still learn such first order logic defined hypothesis. And very briefly, the idea of the proof is it's kind of obvious, admittedly. Uh, we, we, we explore the locality of first order logic, Geifmann's locality theorem to be precise, uh, which basically means, let's say, this is our background structure. These are the training uh, examples. Uh, then basically what Geifmann's theorem says is, well, that's okay, uh, but, but that's good enough for us anyway. Uh, whether a formula holds at a point here or not only depends on a small neighborhood uh, of that point. Where the radius of this neighborhood depends on the quantifier rank of the formula. Okay, so basically to know, um, to know whether this is a positive or negative example, we just have to look at this neighborhood. Um, except that there's still the, the parameters, which are also uh, free variables in our formula and we have to set them, uh, have to set them right. And now the key lemma that falls out of Geifmann's theorem is essentially that parameters that are far away from all the training points are irrelevant, okay? Uh, so basically, uh, so if we have these two parameters, this one we can safely ignore, okay? And now if we turn this around, what this means when we want to learn is uh, what we have to do is we search through all local formulas. Now local formula means uh, one that explicitly refers to the neighborhood to make sure that we only depend on this neighborhood. And then we search through all parameter settings that are close to the training samples because we've just seen we can ignore the rest until we find one uh, that works. Okay, so that's just a simple brute force algorithm uh, that, that, that works here and uh, that basically runs in polynomial time and the number of points we see here and the size of the neighborhoods. And the, uh, the, the, the size of a neighborhood is basically degree uh, to the radius, roughly, 
uh, and radius is fixed, just depends on the quantifier rank, so this is all polynomial. Okay, that's, that's how the running time comes about. And I think from this you can figure out the proof. It's, it's not terribly difficult. Or, okay. So that's the first result. Let me move on to the second. And that's about learning monadic second order hypothesis on strings or regular expressions, but now with parameters. Okay. Um, so how do we model strings as, as our background structures? Well, if we have a string like this, a1 through a n over some alphabet, sigma finite alphabet here, uh, we view it as a structure. That's just the standard uh, thing we always do in finite model theory. So the universe would just be an initial segment of the integers of the right length. We have the binary order relation to relate the positions uh, <coughs> to one another and then for each letter of the alphabet, we have a unary predicate uh, that holds all the positions in the string where this letter appears. Okay? Um, and now let's look at an example. Here we have a long string. Uh, and we get, now we want to learn uh, yeah, a certain pattern of positions in the string. So we get uh, some training examples. So the, uh, the orange ones are labeled uh, as yes, the, the blue ones as no instances. We want to figure out what's going on, what's the pattern behind this. Um, in this case, the pattern is described by this formula, uh, which has one, uh, one uh, parameter variable, and if we set the parameter to that position, it gives us the correct labeling. Okay, that's a fairly simple formula. Basically, okay, what does it say? It says, the, the good positions are the ones that hold an A. Uh, and now if you look at the stretch of A's where this appears, let's see. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at this one. Okay, there we have a sequence of four A's. This one is a good one because the sequence of A's is preceded by a B. That's the pattern, except that uh, here it's the other way around. The good one has a C before the sequence of A's, and that's why, because the parameters flips the whole thing. Okay, now, I don't want you to read the formula. Uh, that's what it says. Um, the reason I'm putting this formula here be is because it's precisely the, the example we need for the next theorem. Um, okay, uh, now, uh, le let's see uh, what, what we get here. So local access, what would local access in a string mean. Let, let's first take a very uh, simplistic view, which is also problematic. I'll come to that. Um, let's just say we can only look at neighbors of positions that we already have, neighbors in the string. Okay, uh, so what can we do then? Well, we can learn quantifier-free first-order formulas and even existential first-order formulas, but only if they are one-dimensional. So we only uh, so, so instances are just elements of the structure, not tuples, okay? Uh, and if they are two-dimensionals or if we have a quantifier alternation, we can't learn it, not in sublinear time. We have to look at the whole string, okay? Um, that's, uh, that's what we get, and the example for, for this EA formula is precisely the one I had on the previous slide. Um, I'm not, not going into this, I'd rather speak about the positive results. Um, where here, this should be read, I mean, the important part is the negative result in, uh, in two, okay? Now, I said we wanted to learn monadic second order formulas. Uh, um, okay, so what's monadic second order logic for those of you who don't know? Basically, it's the extension of first order logic where we can not only quantify uh, over uh, elements of the structure, but also over sets of elements, okay? And that's the same as regular languages. The, the classes of strings we can define are precisely the regular languages. We want to learn uh, MSO formulas, and uh, basically the previous theorem shows that we can't. Not, we can't even, even learn uh, first order logic. So we're very far from it. But now let's look at 
at our local access model. In a way, it's very weak. Basically, if we only look at the neighbors of positions we have, we basically we don't see anything. Imagine us being in the middle of a long stretch of A's. We will never be able to be the see which letters are before and after that long stretch, but that's, that's in a way the relevant information, not all the A's. Uh, so, so the model is, is, is too weak to, to get meaningful access to a long string. Uh, and the solution is, well, we could say, let's, well, this A should hold the information uh, where the pre last previous B is and things like this. So, so if you think about it, what this amounts to is we should somehow have a good index on our background structure, okay? And basically what we said is, okay, uh, let's say we allow our algorithms to, to, to build an index on the, uh, on the background structure in a pre-processing phase before it sees the actual training examples. And the index we use is something that is known as factorization trees uh, in automata theory and monoid theory. Uh, so basically a factorization tree for our data would be uh, a tree where the leaves are labeled by letters of the strings and the internal nodes like here are, are basically la labeled by the type of what is below there. Okay, and that all the monadic second order information about what is below, okay. Uh, and now the thing is, that's a very nice theorem. We can construct such trees <coughs> that are very well behaved and very useful uh, of just constant height in linear time. Okay, that's, uh, the, these are known as Simon factorization trees and they have many applications in automata theory. And we use them as index structures. I haven't seen that used before, but you can argue it's, it's often similar, okay? And, and then we get the theorem um, that we can learn MSO over strings if we allow a pre-processing phase of linear time before we see the data and then we only need time polynomial in the data once we have the index. Okay, uh, the, the, that's the result and uh, the outline in three pictures is basically pre-processing is building a factorization tree. Then training has two phases. One phase is we enter one by one the training examples and we expand the factorization tree. Okay, so we get a training example, this one negative. We follow a path from here to the root, that's constant time because the height is constant. Um, and then we restructure the tree on the way and once we're there, we're done. Uh, and Okay, the tree increases a little bit, but only by an additive constant, and we do this for all the training examples. The tree increases, but the height is still polynomial uh, in the number of training examples. And then the last thing is to actually learn the model, and <coughs> that uh, I'm more or less done. Uh, that requires us to go down from the root to the leaves to find the right parameter settings. Basically, we go down, down once for every parameter we have to find. Okay, and that's, that's how this goes. Okay, let me just uh, make a few concluding remarks. One thing that is nice about uh, this is we have many, many open problems, many like small technical problems which are quite interesting like uh, we can look at other structures, other complexity measures like fixed parameter tractability, new logics. Uh, the question, what are good logics for this? That's an important one, I think. Uh, we have to think about this. We want to go beyond Boolean classification. Uh, we want to design um, also practical algorithms, which our kind of brute force algorithms are definitely not. Um, this is actually something Martin uh, Ritzard is, has started to work on and um, well basically what we want is we want to, to have a data analysis system uh, that is in a way like a database system we can query it but we want to be able to make predictive queries <coughs> and another thing is we also want to be able to uh, to query complex machine learning pro, uh, 
model. So, so part of it should be, okay, now we have a model, uh, say a, a deep neural network. We want to understand what it does and we can see this as an interactive process, a querying process and basically you can imagine see the model as black box, then it amounts to learning whether the query holds for this model. Okay, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed.